she coming? Yes. Is she on her way? Let me introduce you. Okay. Okay. All right. I would like to introduce Cindy, who's going to uh, speak this morning for our uh, Coffees and Combo. And I met Cindy, I don't know how many years ago. Um, her husband, Dennis, does Call of Grace Ministries, which is very evangelistic. They do have tracks, and um, Dennis does a lot of evangelism. Um, so that's how I met them. And recently, we've been reacquainted at the... Um, the monthly associational food drive. We've been, we've been seeing each other. So Cindy and her husband and uh, my husband and I and some other people, we do chaplaining and what we, we, when we give away the food, we talk to people and share Christ with them and um, have the spiritual component. So um, Cindy um, goes to, now I, my thing is on my phone. So tell me what church you go to. Heron First. She goes to Heron First Baptist Church, and I asked her to um, share with us today. So we're very excited to have Cindy come and share what God's put on her heart. Okay, well, thank you, Penny. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, ladies, for coming. And, uh, breakfast was wonderful. <laughs> and Sweets Fellowship here as well. Okay, but before we begin, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now, Father. First and foremost, Father, we just thank you for who you are. Father, we are just so appreciative of all that you do and the ways that we see you work in our lives. And Father, even the ways that we don't see, but we know that you are there. Father, I ask that you would bless this time, that you would bless these words, Father, that they would be received. Father, Father, that you would just empty us of any distractions. So that we might just focus on you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, like I said, Penny has told you that I'm Cindy Moore. And first and foremost, I'm a child of God. Okay. I am the wife of 46 years. I'm the mother of three sons and a daughter. I'm grandma to two great kids and a retired teacher. And co-founder of Call of Grace Ministries, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later. But so here we are, 2023, a brand new year. <clears throat> and I have to ask, does anybody here make resolutions? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Goals. Goals. <laughs> okay. I, to, I, don't yeah. I made a resolution 25 years ago, and I've still kept it. And that was never to make another New Year's resolution. There you go. <laughs> wow. I've tried it. I don't do it anymore. <laughs> It doesn't end well. In fact, it usually ends really quickly, like about a week after New Year. Uh, but what I do try to do is to reflect on the past year. Okay. Um, questions like, what has God taught me? What is he changing in me? Because we don't want to stay where we are. We're always growing. We're always maturing. We're always moving forward. Um, when I say reflect on the past, I don't mean dwell on it. We don't want to get caught up in that cycle, but just to take a look back, okay? And when we do that, it helps us to be intentional about the present, and that's where we live. We live in the present. We don't look back for very long. We're not so concerned with ahead, although we make plans, but let's live in the here and now. So when Penny came to me and said, hey, would you come and share with us? I thought, oh boy, what will I talk about? Um, so I thought about it. I prayed about it. God, what would you have me say? And so I'm sitting in Sunday school that following Sunday. I'm supposed to be engaged in the lesson, okay? But all of a sudden, boy, thoughts just kept flooding me. You know, I'm just thinking, oh my goodness, there was this and this and this. So I grabbed a bulletin and I started jotting down notes so I wouldn't forget. I, thought, well, I don't know what all this is, but I just wrote it all out. And I got home, and I kind of looked and reviewed that, and I thought, wow, God, you practically laid it out in outline form. It was amazing. So I thought, there you go. And then, oh, throughout the next few weeks or so, I'm just still mulling it over, still thinking about it. And I began to notice that, like you probably have, sometimes God speaks to us in themes. And so... Everything I was reading, everything I was listening to, was on the same topic. And I thought, okay, I think this is what I'm going to share. 
And so that's what I thought to, that I would do today is the Lord's laid this on my heart. So let me share it with you. Uh, it's nothing new, but let's, let's look at it as a gentle reminder, okay? And that is that we need to look at the power of the tongue, our voice, okay? And what we are to be using it for, okay? So I think we're all very familiar with uh, the way the world uses their tongue. All around us every day from every direction, TV, radio, social media, um, sadly, sometimes even within the church. We hear gossip, we hear lies, slander, we hear critical speech, harsh words, that goes to tone of voice as well, insults, sarcasm, ridicule, sometimes disguised as all in good fun, but it's not corrupting talk so all those things are are those things that tear a person down okay those are things that poison the listener all of those things are what the Bible calls sin okay so David prayed in Psalm 1914 he said may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight O the Lord my rock and my Redeemer so God has shown me that we are living in a time when we cannot be silent, but neither can we be careless with our own words. The Holy Spirit led James at length to talk about that, and Paul as well. Um, we have an obligation to speak in a manner that reflects our fear of God, but that also our respect for his precepts. That's what our voice is for, okay? In this new year, let's be intentional about focusing on the words that are pleasing to the Lord, words that can change lives, words that change us. The greatest way that we can use our voice that God has blessed us with is to pray, to praise, and to proclaim. Okay, so as we look at Prayer. I know I'm kind of preaching here to the choir, but we know that prayer is not about just asking God for the things that we need or the things that we desire, okay? but it is about establishing a relationship with him, one that's built on faith and trust. Paul reminds the Colossians and, and us that we are to devote ourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. When we pray, it's, it's about the heart, the heart attitude. It's not the actual words we're using. You know, some people get concerned and don't, don't feel comfortable to pray out loud because they think, well, it doesn't sound as eloquent as maybe someone else or whatever. That's not what interests God, right? It's our heart that when we cry out to him, uh, that's the most important part of it. Jeremiah 29, 12 says, you will call upon me and come to me to pray and I will listen to you. Is that not an amazing thought to just stop and contemplate that, that when we pray, we have the full undivided attention of the God of all creation who deems us that important to stop and listen. Okay, and his word promises that he does. Um, he has made us for fellowship with him. And we're called to all types of prayer. We're called to intercessory prayer, to stand in the gap for those that are in need. Look at the examples that scripture gives us. Romans tells us that the Holy Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Jesus himself, seated at the right hand of the Father, is interceding for us. That's the examples that we have to follow on where to do the same for those around us. And of course, there's, there's all different types of prayer, right? There's individual prayer, corporate prayer. There's prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of repentance. The Lord has given us a great blessing in that, but also a great responsibility. Through prayer, we can connect with the Father we can be encouraged and we can encourage others, okay? 
right, so this year, let's be intentional about our prayers. Another way that we use our voice is to praise. We need to be quicker about praising the Lord all through the day, okay? This is our very act of worship. And for one reason only do we do that, and that's because he is worthy of our praise. In Psalm 98, 4, we read, Shout joyfully to the Lord. All the earth shout and sing for joy and sing praises. When we consider the greatness of our God, his glory, his faithfulness, his mercy, his compassion, the very character of God, when we look at that, our only response can be praise. The Bible commands it. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. It's such an awesome thought as well to realize that the Lord inhabits our praises. To praise God is to be in the very presence of God. But understand, as we praise him and give him that due, it also changes us. It allows us to focus our affections. It allows us to realign our priorities. As we praise God, we are more open and receptive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And fortunately, there is no one way to praise. There's no one right way to praise. It looks different for every person. It may be through song, some people choose to praise that way, whether they're singing or whether they're listening. It may be with your hands raised high. It may be with your head bowed in reverence. It may be prostrate on the floor. No matter how we praise, it is a heart filled with gratitude. Keep in mind that each of you are uniquely created by God himself. And as such, no one can praise God the way you can. It's as unique as you are. Our praise demonstrates our dependence on God and our trust in him alone. When we go to him and we praise him for the ways that he is working in our lives, <coughs> we're acknowledging that we trust in everything that he does. When we praise the Lord, our eyes and minds are opened up there's joy in the midst of that praise. There's peace. There's satisfaction. Our cares and our anxieties are cast. Broken spirits are healed in the midst of that praise. So this year, let's be intentional about our praise. And last we pray, we must proclaim God's truth. And, of course, you all know that as followers of Christ, there's just something in us that just has to tell people about Jesus. It's just in there, and it has to come out. We want to share with them who he is and what he's done and what he'll do for them. Okay? Um, but we're living in a world, we're living in a world that's changing. We're seeing it all around us. There's confusion living in a place where evil is now called good, where wrong is right, where right is wrong. All around us we hear people, they're questioning their identities. School systems are changing and they're seeking to circumvent parental authority, uh, abortion clinics on so many corners. There's so many things that you, know, you could think of many as well. Um, the bottom line is that there's division at every turn now. But the one thing that all of those have in common is that it is a denial of God's design. The world is becoming more and more deceived. And so it becomes absolutely imperative for us to proclaim God's truth, to speak the word of God. Many people are never going to hear it if we don't speak up. Of course, we can't make anyone receive it, but we can be obedient to proclaim it. Each of us has been here, been put here for that reason, to pro 
proclaim the goodness of God. Um, and we know that proclaiming the truth must begin by sharing the good news of Christ. That's our starting point. Okay? There's no better news than you can be reconciled to God. And everyone needs to know that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Isaiah 12, 4 reminds us, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. We're living in days where the enemy would even try to tempt believers with compromise, with apathy, busyness, <coughs> anything that would distract us, keep us quiet. We must use our tongues for God's glory. Several years ago, um, <coughs> the Lord was leading my husband, Dennis, to go into full-time evangelism. And so that's kind of how Call of Grace got formed, is because the Lord just wouldn't let up on him about that. He tried to continue to work and do the evangelism. It just wasn't working out. And God was clearly telling him, no, leave the other aside and just, just do evangelism. Um, it was a big leap of faith for us. It meant no more job, no more income. We thought, whoa, what are you going to do? God's just hammering it away. We're like, we have to trust. And so that's how we got started. And, and God in his faithfulness, he made a way where we couldn't see one. He already knew what he had planned. And so the sole purpose for Call of Grace is to share the gospel with the lost. We seek to encourage fellow believers. We share the love of Christ in whatever way we can. Basically, Call of Grace is to point the way to Jesus. And we're all called to do that. Scripture tells us, go and tell. We can all do that. Throughout the year, we kind of partner up with... Um, different churches that have events going on where we can share the gospel. We spend about 10 days or so in Kansas every year. And they have this really unique ministry. It's a John 316 ministry. Um, it's held at the state fair. And God has blessed it. It works. I won't say that it would work everywhere, but it works there. And so we all go to the state fair day after day. It's long days, it's good days a good kind of tired and we give away horseshoes an actual horseshoe and for some reason everyone in Kansas wants a horseshoe and it has John 316 stamped on it and then we will someone there will stamp their name on the bottom or a name they choose on the bottom and kind of a souvenir kind of thing and people line up for this and the only thing to it is that the horseshoe is totally free but while it's being prepared, you must sit down over here in this little tent area and somebody's going to share with you about John 3.16 and what the gospel means. We talk to thousands of people in those 10 days. They just flock. It's as though God is just drawing them in. Their hearts are prepared and ready and they sit down and they listen to a, a gospel presentation all to get this free horseshoe. And while we're there, like I so said, we talked to thousands. And on average, in those week and a half or two weeks, um, we see somewhere between 400 and 600 people come to Christ oh every year. <laughs> yeah. As I said, God bless us this thing supernaturally. Wow. It's unbelievable. Um, and they come and they, they listen and they're just the Spirit just gets hold of them and they're just broken. And they're praying in... And of course, when you've got new converts like that, you cannot leave them hanging. They have to be discipled. And so we have many pastors in that general area in lots of the different towns that have committed. We will follow up. We kind of divide them up by city. And those pastors say, we'll follow up. We'll disciple. We'll get them plugged into a church. And so they're not just left out there thinking, what's next? somebody comes alongside right away and loves them and brings them into the church, teaches them and disciples them. Uh, so it is a great, great ministry to be involved with. And uh, we also work with uh, Bucare Baptist Church. It's in the French Quarter of New Orleans. And New Orleans has a huge homeless population. And so this little church that sits on a tiny little street 
in the French Quarter has opened their doors to all of the homeless and they have just used all of their resources, all of their efforts to minister to them. So the church, they provide clothing, meals, they provide showers, and they open their doors, of course, on Sunday morning for service. And the homeless, they just flock there and hear the word of God. So they have some new plans in process and they're trying to figure out a way to include employment somehow. So God is just working with them and developing this ministry. And it is, it's amazing. And I have learned so much from watching them. I've learned what it looks like to be the hands and feet of Jesus because they are 100% committed to this. So throughout the year, Dennis and I, through Call of Grace, we collect donations of clothing, uh, other items that they might need. They end up needing a lot of blankets, a lot of backpacks, uh, donations of money, whatever, you know, whatever is laid on a person's heart to give. We collect those things all through the year, and then probably usually twice, twice a year, we go to New Orleans and deliver this stuff. And um, while we're there, we get to talk with those people, we get to help out, we get to encourage a lot of them in their walk. Uh, it, it's amazing. I'll tell you a quick little story. Uh, we usually kind of time it, we go kind of late spring, early summer, and we usually go towards the fall when the weather's starting to get cool and kind of try to take, you know, what's needed. So this one particular year, I think it was a couple years ago, uh, we decided maybe we just ought to go now. We've got quite a bit of stuff we need to box up, load up the van, let's just go now. So it's not our usual time. And uh, we packed the van, we put laid down all the seats, boxes filled to the roof, and we are stuffed in there. Off we go to New Orleans. And I had, I had packed that stuff and I had labeled the boxes to give them a general idea of what was there. And we pull up, we get into the, into the French Quarter, we pull up and, and it's, if you've ever seen it, little tiny streets, not much parking available. Right in front of the, the church is the parking spot. We're like, that never happens, how handy, because we're thinking all these boxes that have to be unloaded they pulled in right in front of the church. There's a man sitting on the steps. And we had called the pastor and said, hey, we're, we're just about there. So he was gonna leave his office, come and unlock the church and help us. So this man is sitting there. So we get out and we go and we talk with this man. And we found out it was a homeless man. And the night before, he had laid down, uh, you know, just where, I don't know, they kind of congregate in groups. So he had laid down somewhere. And um, he had made the mistake of taking his shoes off when he went to sleep. And when he woke up, his shoes were gone. Somebody had stolen the shoes. Well, that's the only pair he has. I mean, really all he has is what's on his back, you know. So the only thing he needed to, knew to do was to begin, it was quite a distance, but was to walk to that church because he had heard that they have stuff. So he began to walk all the way down to where the church was in hopes that maybe they'd have a pair of shoes that would work for him. And so he showed us his socks. He had to walk all that way in his socks and it had totally ripped up the, the bottom of his socks. They were just in shreds. And we said, we've got shoes. We don't know, but I mean, we, I know we have a box of shoes. So the pastor got there and unlocked. He's talking to him a little bit first box we pulled off of the van said shoes. So we opened up this box and the man came over and the very first pair of shoes, almost new tennis shoes, man, men's tennis shoes, pull them out, they were his size. Mm. And so he was able to, <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's amazing to watch how God works because he- I am um, all the way from mm, Illinois. Yeah, exactly. And, and so we were able to give him some socks, you know, kind of take care of that need as well. But, but more importantly, I mean, God showed him that day who he was and how he meets needs. And so then the pastor got a chance to talk with him and, you know, try to develop a relationship with him as well. But I thought it's just amazing to me that happens time and time again, right at the right moment, we show up unplanned often, and it's just the very thing that they needed. And uh, 
we had just recently, uh, we sent down some, some uh, blankets and some backpacks and the pastor texted back and he said, we were just saying, what are we gonna do? We're completely out. And they arrived that day. So, you know, God just, God just, in his perfect timing, he just meets those needs. Okay, so that's, you know, some of the things that we do. We kind of, we go to different states and we do different things with them. Um, sometimes we, we, we do try to find local things to do. We do the food bank and, and minister that way to, to proclaim the gospel, to share God's truth with the people that are hurting and need that. And we all need that. Um, so we go to a couple of different food banks for that. We pass tracks when we're there. Uh, sometimes we do parades. We've gone to do parades where we just pass tracks to the people that have gathered. Sometimes we're in the parade and we march with a banner or whatever God leads us to do. Um, during the holiday season, we ring the Salvation Army bell and you know that meets a need for the community, but they are, they've given us permission to pass out anything we wanna pass out, pass out tracks. So we make sure that we just go around to different towns and do it. So if you walk past us at a, at a store or a doorway, everybody gets a tract. Um, Dennis writes his own tracks, and so we can kind of tailor them to events, to holidays, things that are happening. So, you know, kind of kind of works works with the tracks in that way. Um, we do a lighthouse Bible study weekly at the lighthouse shelter in, in Marion, and we've done that now, I think about eight, seven, eight years, and. That a lot has come from that. You know, it's a very transient population in there. They're, they're there maybe a very short time. And so the Bible study is not one continuous, let's study this particular thing. It's more standalone. And we get the basics in there and try to, to minister, minister to them right then because they might not be there tomorrow. And so we're able to work with them. Uh, we've developed some friendships from that. Uh, we've had people move away that still keep in contact, still in church, still doing. Uh, so that's encouraging, you know, that the Lord is using that. Um, of course, Dennis does pulpit supply, lots of area churches. He'll, he'll, he'll go preach anywhere. And uh, he does some evangelism training. Sometimes we work with churches that they're trying to equip their members to be able to share their faith. So we go, we do a little bit of tra evangelism training and stuff. And, help them to feel more confident about doing that. Um, so this year, let's be intentional about proclaiming God's truth, okay? Let's not miss an opportunity. You know, sometimes it's hard, we kinda get tunnel vision and we're in a hurry during the day and we're, we've got things that have to get accomplished. But I think that if we can step back and, and truly be intentional about these things, then that's gonna be on the floor of thoughts and will help us to see those opportunities because God places them in our lives all the time. We just need to be looking for them. And so my prayer for all of us today is that in this new year, that we'll receive this gentle reminder, asking the Holy Spirit to empower us like never before, to pray, to praise, and to proclaim. And I have to share this with you because it was just, this is just so God. Um, when I was writing down notes here and kind of trying to put something together, you know, literally the last period on the last page, my phone dinged and it was a text. So I just, I'm done. I picked up the text to see, well, who, who is this? And it was a text from the Family Research Council. And all the text said was, Will you follow culture or have the courage to stand on the unchanging word of God and proclaim truth that changes hearts? <laughs> and so to that, I, I can only say amen for all of us. So thank you ladies for listening and uh, I hope that you'll be able to, to hold on to some of that and just to apply that to your lives. I know that you are now, but uh, I'm hopeful that in 2023 that we can hone our focus a little more and that we can be so intentional about what we say, what we do, what we think, that it's pleasing to the Lord. Okay, thank you.
I'm going to let Penny turn off her recording before it's my turn. It's different. 